This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State Farm System Specialist Ignacio Ciampitti begins today's show with how the corn growing season went and is influencing this year's harvest. Jeff Whitworth, K-State crop entomologist, continues the show by discussing current crop pests in Kansas that he has been receiving questions about. He reviews chinch bugs, aphids, armyworms, and grasshoppers. Completing the show is K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook, as he reminds producers that nutrition impacts milk production, so producers should check with their local nutritionist when making feed decisions. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Tuesday show with a discussion on corn harvest. And in to share his knowledge, we have K-State Farm System Specialist Ignacio Ciampitti. Ignacio, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Henry, for your invitation. So talking about corn harvest, Ignacio, how was this year? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, to be honest, I mean, it was just a roller coaster, like moving all the way from some good conditions early season, depending on the region of the state. Then the challenges that we face during the July, August weather, and right now some of the things that we are encountering, you know, as we are getting to harvest in many of our locations, we start seeing a lot of complex scenarios for corn this year. And as we're looking at some people are harvesting and chopping their corn, kind of what has it been looking like across the state? Well, it's very diverse. I mean, as our state the last couple of weeks, and then by talking with some farmers, we go from situations where farmers that they have irrigation, I mean, they are in a completely different scenario, till one thing that is very important for this year to understand why we finish, like what we are ending this year, we have seen two kind of uh, things that are quite unique. The first one, if you look at our July weather, which is one of the most critical. So if you think about as a farmer, for corn, if you are planting early, that weather around flowering, and we usually say the 30 days within flowering time are really critical to establish and to define if that corn is going to yield 100% of the potential, what a farmer usually estimates early season, or if the conditions are not good. In many cases, we expect that the weather around flowering it might make an impact closer to 50% of yield reduction coming just from the weather around flowering. And I'm saying this because that shows how sensitive is corn to any weather conditions that are basically taking place during that time of the year. When I'm saying weather conditions, we talk mainly specifically, let's focus on drought, and we talk about the lack of precipitations that we have in many situations, in many parts of the state during July, and we'll get back to August. And the second one is uh, this year particularly high temperatures. And when you talk to farmers, I mean, we know that corn really likes sunny days and really likes high temperature. And many of the questions that we have many times is how high is too high in terms of temperatures. And this year we have seen temperatures that they were extremely high. And in many situations, I mean, we were okay if you are probably 95, 100 degrees on terms of temperatures. When we are moving above those numbers, during the day temperature is becoming a problem. And particularly one of the problems that we face this year in early July, late July, and then a little bit on the side of the end of August, where the high temperatures, and mainly on the central and the eastern part of the state. So if you want to focus in some of the the most, I would say, complex regions for corn this year, believe it or not, it's on the central part, all the central corridor, and also the eastern part. Mainly we have high temperatures during the day, but also, which is a factor that I think that we start seeing more and more often in the last, I would say, two or three decades, we start seeing high temperatures during the night. So many situations when the day temperatures are really high, those night temperatures are staying quite close. And even when we are expecting to see low temperatures closer to the beginning of the day, 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, we still see that those temperatures are on the high end. And one of the main factors affecting the plant and reducing the productivity is that lack of difference between the day and the night. The plant during the day is fixing carbon, accumulating sugars. Those sugars the plant is using it to grow. 
And during the night, usually what it does is basically using some of those sugars to start continuing growing the plants. And the plants are growing fantastically during the night. What happens in many of the situations when you have shorter or lower variation between day and night temperatures is that that plant doesn't use those sugars. Those sugars are not going for any growth. And then in many situations, they are only being used to repair. And then the plant is not basically growing. We have seen this year many weeks where the plant was basically continuously not growing and just keeping up, trying to maintain functionality. And this is a result of what we are seeing today in many of our harvest yield. We were talking to some farmers, for example, Central Kansas or Wichita, some of the dryland corn, also in the Salina area. Some of those yields are extremely low. So some of the farmers that we talked, I mean, last couple of weeks, we were seeing yields that they were in, in places 40, 50 bushels. When dryland corn in some of that area could, in many places, in many situations, could yield an, until 100, 150 bushels. So we are seeing that kind of a yield reduction that in some places is close to 50%. Or more. And this year is not only coming from stress conditions during the flowering time, but also during the last week of August, when the plant is feeding those kernels, we have really poor conditions. We don't have we didn't have that change in precipitation as expected, because there was a projection to be an Nino and to have more precipitation. We have some precipitation, but not as much. And the other factor that we discussed earlier on this piece, the high temperatures again. We have high temperatures during the last week of August that really just basically finish the crop. If you look at most of the, the problems that we face today, if you start looking at corn ears in the central and the eastern part of the state, you will see that many of those ears, they see some kernel abortion. So you see ear sizes that they are particularly not bad, but many times those top of the, the ears, those kernels are completely aborted. And that is basically a just a sign of the situation that we went through after flowering. And then the last piece to basically just help us to put yield as probably low as possible is the problem that many of these kernels were not in some places completely filled. And even we have late abortion. We have probably kernels that they went through the process of pollination and effective kernel formation, but then we have abortion sometimes even 30 days after flowering. Uh, and those are the situations that if you look at also the kernel size, which in many places can compensate to 20% or more over the yield, this year we haven't seen any compensation or in many places almost like very low or poor kernel size. That explains a little bit about how we are ending this growing season. A lot of challenges, to be honest, for many farmers, many of them working on dryland, many, many challenges for those working on the irrigation. And we have a few contacts and, and we check with people. Again, the irrigation helps to mitigate in some of the eastern part of the state or even the ones that they have access on the central region. But the heat temperature and the stress on heat still was showing up, which basically for a irrigation condition where farmers were expecting good yield levels, we still have seen 10, 20 percent lower, or in many cases lower than the potential and the irrigation just because of the heat. As producers have gotten this crop out of their field or are still working on getting it out, are there things producers need to think about doing after it's out of the field? I would say many things to think about for many of the farmers. I mean, they they need to start thinking about basically problems on lodging. We've seen in some fields that in some areas, some of their corn was very susceptible, so the plants were not standing that well. So plant lodging could be a problem. So just to be careful on that. And when you see fields that they are presenting problems on the lodging side, put priority to those so they are basically start seeing those problems. Because once the ears or the plants are breaking, ears are on the ground, you start having problems of moldy ears and quality, which is another problem this year. And then the other thing just to, to realize is that some of this corn that in many situations was fertilized for a high yield, this year we will show lower yields. So don't be surprised to see potential high nitrate levels on the stocks because that's another symptom of those plants that they were shooting for high yields, but they finish with lower yield and they will have a little bit higher levels of nitrate on the stock. And as we look forward to next year, are there a few things that producers can maybe do to help put their best foot forward? I think that this shows, again, as always, the, the complexity behind being a farmer. Uh, it's not a simple task. The only piece that I always mention to them and and trying to help them is to say, be conservative. If you start the growing season with low water 
or low soil moisture in the early in the season, try to play conservative. Don't be too aggressive. I mean, because we don't know how Mother Nature is going to behave, and being conservative sometimes pays off. And what I'm saying, being conservative means in some places trying to adjust your input and looking at that input and don't just go to the high input level and trying to be more conservative on, on maybe on the thin rate or the nitrogen fertilization. Sometimes that pays off and more in the situations where we are thinking that we're planning to start with low soil moisture. And based on what we are looking for the coming months, unless we start seeing a change on the pattern on the weather and more precipitations, next year could be still very challenging too, unless we start seeing some changes on the precipitation going into March, April timeframe. So think about those when you take your decisions for inputs for next year and diversify. Don't try to plant everything at one or two weeks. This idea helps farmers to make sure that they probably put the best crop earlier in best places, and then also trying to diversify some of the acres to try to play these acres in other places, in other time during the season. So if you have a stress coming in July or a specific time in the season, you might lose some of your some yield in some acres, but you might be able to go through or kind of escape that stress for some of the rest of the acres. And, and that will help us to be a little more conservative on thinking about how to work on this crop. Nasi, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and kind of give us some information about how corn harvest is going this year. Yeah, thank you for your time, too. That was K-State Farm System Specialist Ignacio Ciampiti. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. We continue our Tuesday show discussing current insect considerations. And today we're joined by Key State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Sure, anytime. First, talking about our current insect, which we've talked a little bit about, is chinch bugs. We've talked quite a bit about chinch bugs, not just this year, but over the years. It's a continuing pest. The questions now, there have been, there still are huge numbers of chinch bugs in sorghum, basically. The late planted sorghum still has some green to it, so the chinch bugs can still go out and suck a little juice out of the plants. But they will be moving out of the out of the sorghum. Typically what they do is as sorghum dries down or senesces, the chinch bugs move out into a lot of times wheat fields because the wheat is starting to germinate and chinch bugs will feed on any grass they come to first. So a lot of times uh, the growers will plant their wheat before they harvest their sorghum or before the sorghum dries down. So those chinch bugs move out and they get into the wheat. And it, as I said, they will feed on any grass that has juice available for them to get some nourishment from. The problem is right now, you know, the question we're getting is, do the chinch bugs, do I, do I put an insecticide on my wheat so I have a good seed treatment to protect against chinch bugs and other pests. Generally in Kansas so far, we do not recommend seed treatments on wheat. They work, don't get me wrong, they work really well, but we just don't need them. Now with chinch bugs, as the chinch bugs move out of the sorghum, primarily they're going to be adults. The adults do not feed as much as the nymphs as they have for the last two or three months as the immatures Uh, You know, they're kind of like the teenage set where they feed 24-7. The adults, they will move out and they will get into the wheat if there's germinating wheat adjacent or close by. But they don't feed as much, number one. Number two, they're going to move on to look for overwintering sites because the adult chinch bug is the stage that overwinters. So they're going to look for old bunch grasses or someplace where there's a lot of heavy residue on the surface where they can crawl under to survive the winter. So a lot of times the chinch bugs will get into the wheat, and I get calls about chinch bugs in wheat, and they're accused of thinning wheat. But a lot of times I don't think it's a chinch bug per se. I think they're just out there. The growers are out looking at the wheat because it's a thin spot, and they see chinch bugs. I really, in in the many years that I've been doing this, I really have never, ever been able to determined that chinch bugs actually caused thinness of wheat. Right now, you know, one of the problems we have is moisture. We had some good moisture recently in 
certain parts of the state, that begs the question, should I plant now while I have moisture because the long-range forecast doesn't seem to call for it. Other parts of the state have not had any. It's still dry. Just remember, the later you plant, the better off you are as far as pests and or pathogens go or problems in wheat up to the point where, you know, it's agronomically disadvantageous to not to plant. So as far as pests go, waiting till mid to late October is best to avoid just about all of the wheat pests, including pathogens, and especially chinch bugs. So if there's no volunteer wheat, the chinch bugs won't hang around. Uh, remember, we stress getting rid of the volunteer all the time and at least two weeks prior to your wheat germinating that you've planted. So we really have never recommended doing a seed treatment for insecticides for um, wheat. We still don't, and we still are recommending wait as late as possible to plant your wheat to avoid chinch bugs. Like I said, once the sorghum dries, there's nothing there for them to feed on. They'll move out. Or if there's a lot of residue right there in that sorghum field, they may stay there and try and overwinter in the field. But for now, there is a lot of concern because there are a lot of chinch bugs, and they are going to be moving out of sorghum. And hopefully we will get some moisture and the wheat will germinate, and that will be a question. But I really don't think the chinch bug adults, I think they're more concerned about finding overwintering sites than they are feeding on wheat. So I really don't think that should be a big concern right now. And another thing producers might want to think about when they're working on putting wheat in or hopefully waiting until that desired time, aphids. Yes, we get aphids, primarily bird, oat, cherry aphids, and green bugs on wheat all the time. They're continually migrating in from the south anytime we have southern breezes, and that can happen clear up until December. Again, if there's no wheat there, there's no problem. But those aphids, and there are, I think, 26 or 27, actually, different species of aphids in Kansas on wheat that have the potential of vectoring one of the viruses that cause barley yellow dwarf, the disease. So if there's no wheat there, the aphids come in. There's nothing for the aphids to feed on. Therefore, they don't vector the barley yellow dwarf. The earlier planted wheat, the aphids come in, and it's the barley yellow dwarf that gets started in the fall that is more damaging to the wheat because it will stay there and then they'll be increased in the in the spring by other aphids as they feed on it. It's That's how the virus is vectored is for aphids feeding on wheat and then they fly over and feed on it or crawl over and feed on to a, another plant that doesn't have it and that plant gets uh, that particular virus. So if you plant wheat late, again, you'll still can have aphids but the barley yellow dwarf has less chance of getting started. And if it is there, it'll have less chance of being transmitted to other plants within the field. So again, the aphids are going to be there. They're going to continue to come in. But the later the planted wheat, the better off you are as far as avoiding barley yellow dwarf. The barley yellow dwarf that gets started in the spring doesn't seem to have nearly the impact on yield as it does in the fall. So that's another consideration for planting as late as possible. In fall, also thinking about alfalfa planting, and there's a few pests producers probably want to keep in mind there as well. Yes, I get calls about alfalfa all the time. One of them is the army worms or the beet army worms or the army cutworms because uh, they get in alfalfa. And they can do a number in late if alfalfa is planted early in the fall so that it comes up in the fall. It's pretty attractive to these insects. It's a new succulent plant, and they can do a number on it before it gets pretty well established. So the worm complex, army worms, and also grasshoppers. Grasshoppers can move in from grasses as the brome and the other grasses start drying up that they've been feeding on or laying eggs in as that new succulent alfalfa starts to germinate, they will move into there, and they can do a number on alfalfa, especially if we have drier conditions. Again, if we have nice, moist conditions, it really helps uh, these plants withstand a lot more damage. But right now, it doesn't look like it. So the other pest we really worry about in alfalfa, the number one pest is the alfalfa weevil. And they're moving back to alfalfa fields now. They move back in September and October. The guys always want to know if they plant alfalfa 
if they will be infested with, if their fields will be infested with alfalfa weevil, they will. I don't know what else to tell you, but again, the later planted, the less infestation you will have. So if you plant alfalfa later on, it will help avoid these pests also. But you still, you got to, you know, couple that with agronomically ideal time to plant it so that you get a good stand going into the spring. So just remember, as far as wheat goes, as far as alfalfa planting goes, the later you can plant, the better off you are as far as avoiding pests, whether they're pathogens or insect pests. And one more insect pest that people might just be seeing a little bit of everywhere is grasshoppers. There are a lot of grasshoppers around. For the last, well, since mid-August through September, the grasshoppers have been laying eggs. So they haven't been as active in feeding. But it seems to me like over the years, after that month of intensive oviposition or egg laying, then the grasshoppers that are left, they move out and they look for succulent green plants to eat, feed on. And again, it, it depends on the fall. If we have an open fall, you know, if it stays warm, clear up until oh, the first part of December, grasshoppers, these army worms, the beet army worms, they can really do a number on alfalfa or wheat or whatever crop they're in, especially if we don't have good moisture. So the plants are struggling for moisture anyway. These pests can do a number. The nice thing about it, the grasshoppers, the army worms, they're not going to overwinter. So the question I always get is how cold. It needs to be in the mid-20s for a couple of hours, actually, to do away with any of these insect pests. But once it gets down into the mid-20s, it'll do away with these pests, except the army cutworm. If you remember last spring, we had a lot of miller moths. They called them, especially in the south central part of the state. They were a real nuisance. They were on TV and the radio. And those are the adult of the army cutworm. So they are moving back into the state. We just saw a couple this past week. They're moving back in the state from where they've oversummered in Colorado, and they are ovipositing. They're laying eggs. Um, they lay eggs in wheat. There's no wheat planted yet. So what are they going to do? They're going to lay eggs in alfalfa or in fields. So, again, the later you plant your wheat, the later you plant your alfalfa, uh, the better chance you have of missing out on army cutworm infestations. And I think probably as of right now, if if they find considerable fields, you know, that are uh, susceptible for their egg laying, I think we'll have a pretty good population of army cutworms next year just because – I usually don't even see any adults in the fall, and I've already seen a couple this year. So I know there's pretty good potential of there being a few more this year than normal. Jeff, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and update us with some current insect considerations for producers. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Anytime. That was K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. We end today's program with this week's milk lines. Feed cost is typically more than 50% of a producer's expenses. While controlling feed cost is important, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brooks says that providing animals quality feed is also important. Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning what we might need to consider as we feed cows through these economic times. I know that most of you are very concerned about where we're at with feed costs and where we're at with the margins. And as we look at the milk-to-feed price ratios, particularly for the months of June and July, nationwide, those were the lowest they've ever been. So as we progress into August and the later months of 2023, there will probably be some improvement in that as we see maybe a slight drop in feed cost, and we see an uptick in the relative value of your raw milk on your farm. However, as you look at your total feed cost budget and your total cost on your dairy, feed cost is probably more than 50% of your expenses. So many of us are concerned about that, but I want you to understand that feed is very, very important to your animals. Number one, you only get one chance to set peak milk production in a cow's lactation. So if you short her on groceries, i.e. nutrients, and she has a lower peak, she's going to have a lower milk production level throughout the lactation. So 
make sure you make your choices wisely. Make sure you're using a nutritionist to balance those rations as they should be. As we look at what's important in the ration and some things that you might want to evaluate, the pounds of dry matter fed per unit of milk is very important. In general, uh, we should be feeding about uh, 1.5 pounds of dry matter for every pound of milk that our cows are producing. When uh, that uh, ratio drops to 1.3, that may be concerning. Why is that concerning? Well, we should be getting more dry matter into the cows. A lot of times when we drop to uh, these levels, that means that we're not uh, getting the amount of milk nor the dry matter into the cows that we would expect. And as you look at components, uh, obviously as we look at fat and protein that your animals are producing, how much should they be producing? Well, in general, we'd say that they need to be producing about 5.5 pounds or more of fat and protein per cow per day. And as we get closer to 7, obviously our milk margin will uh, go up significantly. Now, where are some leakage points in your diet? Well, you might want to look at starch levels. For one thing, corn's fairly expensive, so as we look at uh, the starch level in the diet, we can evaluate that from a ration standpoint, but we should probably should also take some samples of manure and see where those starch levels actually are at. Normally, we would suggest that starch levels should be less than 4%. When you look at uh, levels that are higher than that, you need to figure out why you're not getting good starch utilization. It could be the fact that we're not grinding the dry corn uh, fine enough. It could be the fact that we didn't do a correct job of kernel processing when we put up corn silage. Another area that you need to look at is the MUN levels of your herd. And again, you need to do this with your nutritionist. In general, most of us consider that an average for a herd should be somewhere between 8 to 12, keeping in mind that this is an indication of whether or not we're underfeeding or overfeeding crude protein, and in particular, rumen degradable protein. That's why you need to work with your nutritionist to make sure that these levels are appropriate for the level of production of your herd. Finally, forage quality always is important as we look at how we feed our cows. And again, if you're not looking at fiber digestibility of the forages that you're feeding, you need to start doing that. And again, I'd encourage you to work very closely with your nutritionist on this. As we get forages that have higher fiber digestibility, it will reduce our dependence on corn or energy sources in the diet. It'll also generally increase rate of passage, which helps us in increasing milk production in our herd. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, reminding our dairy producers that cutting feed cost could come at a cost of increased milk production. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.